Good morning, good afternoon. Thank you for this opportunity to share with you uh, on some basic facts about the COVID vaccine. My name is Dr. Esther Tan, and I'm the Senior Medical Officer with DMOSH Public Health Section. I'm gonna share my slides now. So I'm sure many of you who have not yet got the vaccine have a lot of concerns about the vaccine. Common ones are, I'm not sure that it's safe to be vaccinated. I don't need the vaccine. I'm young and healthy. Um, I'm already sick with the, uh, with the COVID, so I don't need the vaccine. So this presentation will be um, to outline for you some of these concerns and give you some of these facts. So to start off, um, the reason why I became a public health physician was because of this, because I know that vaccines save lives. And um, it's not just vaccines that save lives, actually it's the vaccinations. So getting um, the shot into people's arms, that is what actually saved lives. And as you know, as of now, which is near the end of May, uh, we've had over 167 million deaths worldwide and over three and a half, uh, 3.4 million deaths globally. You can see this curve, which shows you all the cumulative cases of coronavirus since the start of the pandemic. Uh, and you can still see the curve going up. And we don't know where this is gonna lead to, whether it will continue to increase or will there be a flattening of this curve? I'm sure you've heard a lot about variants and uh, having new variants uh, popping up. Um, WHO has made it clear that all of the major pro uh, protective measures like physical distancing, uh, masking, uh, vaccines, all the current vaccines still work against um, these variants. And so um, WHO recommends highly that we continue with these protective measures as well as with vaccinations. Just to go over kind of the risks of COVID, um, you can see from this um, slide here that these are some of the top five causes of deaths globally. Uh, and based on these estimates, COVID is the fourth leading cause of death globally, globally um, after ischemic heart disease, stroke, and chronic obstructive lung disease. This shows you uh, the top five causes of death globally by WHO regions. Um, and the part in orange actually shows you the uh, COVID deaths. And you can see it's still a significant proportion. Of course, we know that there are certain people that are at higher risk of uh, severe disease as well as deaths. And who are these people? These are older adults, usually 60 and above, and people who have serious chronic medical conditions uh, like heart disease, lung disease, diabetes, cancers, et cetera. So I'm now gonna turn to the design of vaccines um, as well as you know, how vaccines are developed. Are there any shortcuts in the process? And then talk a little bit about complications of vaccines. So first question, how is vaccine safety, immune response, and how effective is it? How is all this tested? So all drugs and vaccines go through a standard process and that involves preclinical trials, phase one trials, phase two trials, phase three trials, and then phase four trials. So all the current vaccines in the market right now have gone through the phase up to phase three trials. And I'll give you some explanation about what those phases are. So this shows you the stages of the clinical trials. So the first would be that preclinical stage, which is really the stage when the vaccine or the drug is tested in animals um, to determine if it will be safe and effective for people. And then they go, it will go on to the phase one trial where a small number of people we tested on 
for safety of the medication and primarily just looking at safety. There is no progression to each phase uh, without clear approval of uh, each phase. So this, after phase one, it will not move on to phase two if people find that there are safety concerns uh, in this here or here. So moving on to phase two, phase two is when there's a slightly a larger group of maybe hundreds of people where they would test for safety and effectiveness. And then phase three, it moves over to thousands of people, tens of thousands of people are tested. Again, looking at safety, effectiveness, and what's the appropriate dose um, that would give you the correct outcome that you want. And then phase four is an ongoing long-term study uh, where people look at what are the side effects on a long, long-term basis. So all of the current vaccines in the market right now all have hit at least phase three. So I'm sure you've heard a lot in the news that um, you know, vaccines have been fast-tracked and you're probably asking yourself that are there some shortcuts in that process? Why is it faster than usual? Um, because we know that vaccines typically take many years to um, pr be produced. So the reason for this, um, I'm gonna show you, this is an example um, of a, the, on the right side is of the regular process. So uh, here, this long bar here um, shows you those phases that I explained to you that this is the testing phase. And then after um, drugs, or vaccines finish all this testing phase, it moves on to the proper approval phase. And after all the approvals are being uh, obtained, it will then move on to the manufacturing phase where pharmaceutical companies actually spend years sometimes uh, manufacturing these vaccines in large quantity because it's not so easy to actually manufacture these vaccines. And then finally, you then distribute it out into the market. So the reason for this pandemic and why during this pandemic, the process seemed to be a lot faster is actually because for the production phase, um, there's a lot of financial risk involved. Obviously, pharmaceutical companies need to uh, spend a lot of money to do this phase. And so they typically don't start this production phase until all the necessary approvals have been got. However, in the COVID pandemic, this was actually fast tracked. And how, how was that done? Um, governments actually stepped up, the US and other governments stepped up and actually protected um, and underwrit some of these uh, financial risks here, such that pharmaceutical companies did both in parallel. So instead of doing this in sequence, they actually did this in parallel. So what that means is that while the studies and the tests were being done, at the same time, um, they actually were starting to produce the vaccines because these usually take a long time. But just because this was done in parallel, uh, doesn't mean that the testing process was shortcut or different in any way and they still have to go through the standard approval process. In terms of why um, you know, we call these vaccines uh, only for emergency use authorization versus the full license or approval. So WHO, um, as well as our regulatory bodies around the world, all have a process of emergency use approval where um, they look at all the data, make sure it's safe, make sure it's effective, and then do an emergency uh, process because it's a public health emergency. So this at all has no bearing on the fact that uh, these processes of testing were short cut or anything like that. The, the, the standard uh, rigorous uh, measures still need to apply in terms of looking at safety and effect. So now I'm gonna move on to a vaccine itself. So uh, the COVID vaccine is produced in various platforms. Um, and you know, traditionally, 
the one that we're probably most familiar with um, is when a um, virus is used. And so how vaccines typically work is that you have uh, a weaker form of the virus um, and it could be a, almost a, maybe a dead form of the virus and is injected into your body and it acts like a, like a kind of a trainer for your um, antibodies, which I like to call as soldiers, like protecting you. Um, so those antibodies learn what the bad virus looks like, except that in a vaccine situation is typically either it's a dead virus or it's um, a very, very weak virus. So then your body is trained on how to detect it, how to deal with it, and they are more alert the next time around when you actually get the real virus. So these different technologies really is a way of different ways of introducing um, a virus a part into your body so that your body is trained on how to detect it when the real one comes. So for example, uh, the adenovirus uses a viral vector technology. Uh, and this is a tried and tested technology previously used for hepatitis B, for example. Um, you can also use where you can also have a protein only vaccine. So instead of the whole virus, just a part of it uh, is actually put into the body so that your immune system can prepare for it. Again, this is all tried and tested previously used is for other vaccines before. And then the newer technology is the mRNA technology. And that's when um, they actually introduce a short genetic coding uh, so that, it, that your genetic coding can actually produce the needed protein um, to, to be able to help your soldiers fight against um, like a fake kind of virus. So there's always a lot of concern that, oh, you know, you're introducing genetic material into my body. Will it have long-term effects on me? Well, actually this, this genetic material is just introduced uh, into your cell and it's not at all affecting your DNA, not at all affecting um, your nucleus material. So it will have no long-term effect on um, your cells or your um, genetic material, anything like that. Is just a way of being able to produce out the fake kind of fake virus so that your body can be trained on how to deal with it when the real one comes, that's all. In terms of effectiveness, so um, this just shows you range of effectiveness. Um, and as you know, uh, the UN has procured the AstraZeneca vaccine. And there, of course, there are other vaccines in the market. So there's a range of effectiveness. The AstraZeneca vaccine is about 70%. And this 70% is, is really based on their phase three trials. So all of these vaccines um, had to do these large, you know, phase three trials after they finished the phase one, phase two. So for example, for AstraZeneca, they had their phase three trial of 11 persons and they divided it into people who would take the vaccine and then the other half would not take the vaccine, but then they would be blinded, meaning that either group does not know actually did they get the vaccine or they didn't. So in this way, you can control for any like placebo effect. So out of those uh, two groups, you can see that out of 11,000 people, uh, only 30 cases there were only 30 COVID cases in a vaccine group versus 101 cases of control groups. So this shows that not only was the number of uh, COVID cases very low in general, um, but also that if they had taken the vaccine, uh, it was actually protective because there were like three and a half times of the number of people who got COVID in the non-vaccine group versus the vaccine group. Okay, and the last a word about um, the condition of having uh, blood clots and low platelet count and what we call TTS, which is thrombosis and thrombocytopenia syndrome. 
Um, and this is a, has been associated with AstraZeneca or the Johnson Johnson vaccine. And just to say that this is a really extremely rare condition. Um, I put here some of the uh, WHO statement there, the most recent statement. And it says that to note that um, these events are very rare uh, with low numbers reported among the almost 200 million people who have received uh, the vaccine around the world. And this was after assessment of data from the European Medicine Agency, UK, and other countries who were submitting data about this condition that they saw. Um, and you know, estimates really range in terms of um, how, uh, how frequent this condition is after AstraZeneca vaccine. But right now, it ranges from around one to five uh, cases per million doses given. So again, super, super rare. Just to say that um, what I was talking about just now was the very rare and more serious type of complications. However, you can also definitely get mild side effects after vaccine. Um, and what are these kind of mild side effects? Usually you get it around the first or the second day uh, after the vaccine and you can get soreness around the injection area. You can mild fever, you can feel fatigue and tired, headache, some joint pain. Um, and you can just rest and take medicines for fever and pain as you need. So in conclusion, I just wanna say that uh, vaccination of course is not mandatory. Uh, it is your choice. Um, and you'll just have to weigh the risk and benefit uh, of making this choice. And so I'll leave it up to you what choice you'll make, but I hope that I've given you some facts for that. Um, I have another uh, video that uh, based on a uh, presentation that we made previously, uh, just about vaccines in general. If you want more information about really basics about uh, COVID vaccine, you can go to that site. For any questions, you can email us uh, at covidvaccines at un.org or uh, Dimash Public Health. Thank you very much.